everyone. Welcome to our very first edition of Summer School. I'm Ashley Rosser, a Victory Fiduciary, and if you've been tuning in for the past few months, you know that we have been gearing up to be able to bring local professionals to our viewers and our clients to be able to bring some specific relevant topics um, that we think uh, are important for your overall uh, wealth management. And so today, I'm so excited to be sitting here with Shanti Copeland. Shanti is owner of Copeland Consulting, and I think that um, credit and debt repair and management is really a huge topic of concern um, for our country right now, specifically kind of in the uh, financial environment that many um, Americans find themselves in. We're in a period of high inflation. Cost of goods has skyrocketed over the past few months, and so um, while many jobs have not been able to increase salaries to kind of accommodate for that, Americans have less and less money left in their pockets to be able to just buy um, the goods that they need every week. And so I think that it's expected that we can assume that credit balances are going to continue to rise in the country. And that can really have a, a significant negative um, effect on people's overall you know, financial health. And so um, Shanti is an expert in credit and debt management and repair. And so really looking forward to kind of hearing um, your thoughts about kind of where we are and what are some basic steps that we can kind of be, first of all, knowing and then kind of actionable. So um, why don't you just take a minute, though, and kind of give us your background about kind of what led you to this career? Okay, thank you for having me, Ashley. Oh, it's our pleasure. Well, I, like most Americans, found myself in debt. What I ended up doing was learning as much as I could about it. I started with the stats of the American country, how I spent in the numbers. The average American has about $90,000 worth of debt between credit cards, student loans, mortgages, and other medical bills. Wow. And many of us are not, we're drowning in it. We're not really making headway with it. It is really taking over our lives. And like she said, with inflation, everything is being uh, almost unattainable without money. So we're resorting to using credit cards, loans, payday loans is another thing, which is still a form of credit. And that's where we find ourselves uh, today as a country. And I would need us all to learn different ways to manage it and get a hold of it so that it doesn't overtake us. Okay, great. So I guess maybe talk to us a little bit um, about like if you're just sitting down with a client, what's some of like maybe the most important information to kind of go over or, or kind of explain um, just for someone who maybe doesn't have a lot of knowledge in general about credit? First, I teach them to look at what their numbers are. I can give you state numbers, country numbers, but if you, I don't know your numbers, you can't work on that. Uh, you can't fix what you don't know. So once you've learned and looked at everything that's in your hand, and say, this is who I am on paper. Now we can check off each thing and go through it and address each one individually. Are you finding that um, credit balances are kind of determined about where you are in life? Yes, absolutely. The Gen X's, which are the 18 to 30s, they have a total of about $10,000 in non-mortgage debt, meaning it's not a home loan, it's not an auto loan. It would be credit cards. The next generation, which is millennials, they will have about $27,000 because as they live and get homes of their own apartments or whatever, they get credit cards and they use them. They, they use it to entertain themselves, to travel, to furnish their home, mm -hmm. to subsidize what their paycheck doesn't with the hopes of, I'll pay it at the end of the month. Then there is Gen X's, which are the 40s and between 40 and 50, they are heavy in the, in the mortgage debt. They have something like $29,000 in non-mortgage debt and a mortgage. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes that a tougher thing to pay. Then the baby boomers, which is 55 and older, it starts to significantly increase because by then your mortgage drops off and your credit card debts usually are very minimal because they're probably empty nesters and they're not spending as much money. So you see the boomers, their credit, um, their debt goes down significantly. Yes, they're, they're almost at 2500 wow. a year. 
Oh, wow. Okay. And versus 27. Sure. At okay. a, as a 30 year old would have. Wow. And they have more income as well. Sure. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. So, what are, you know, some things then, if, if somebody came to you and they were like, you know, I, I, I don't even know what, what debt is. Like, well, you know, I think that there's a lot of people who don't even understand that certain things go on your credit report, um, that they may be reported differently. Some carry more weight than others. So maybe we can kind of talk a little bit then about that for someone who says, I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't even know what my credit score means. Is it a good score? Is it a bad score? I mean, okay. these are all things that. Well, in the rates, in the score rating, it's 300 to 500, which is considered the poor rating. You are still not really, some people, it's because they don't have credit and some because they have too much. And then we go up to the next step, which is called FAIR, which will be a 500 to maybe a 560. Okay. And then GOOD falls under the 6, almost 5600 up to 650. EXCELLENT goes from 650 to 850. Okay. Uh, the extra 50 points is other variables, but the highest that FICO reports is 800. Okay. That's our everyone's goal. Sure. They think I made it because I got there, but it's very tricky slope when it's more than just what you owe. Credit cards hold the most weight on your credit score because the interest rates are higher. They can change your balance if they feel like it. If they mm -hmm. notice you're getting too much credit, they'll say, hey, she's a risk. Lower that payment. Lower that rate. Lower that uh, available balance. Because it'll be a $10,000 card, but if you have 20 $10,000 cards, the other first ones are going to go, wait a minute, she's getting too much. So you're saying, so credit cards can actually say it was a $10,000 limit, we're now going to reduce that to five because Absolutely. she's a higher risk. All during COVID. It was, wow. it was amazing. Well, because I would think that would drop your credit score yeah, then. It does. Because now it's showing that you're using more of an available balance right. than what, so yeah, I mean, right. so I, that, that, I can see how that could The perfect be ratio is 30% or lower usage, which is called utilization, um, about balance due, balance used, whatever how you put it. But if you use up to 30% of it and stay below that, you're in a good sweet spot where you're not quite a risk. If you had to pay it, you could. And that's how they see it as well. Okay. We, we're not going to have to hunt her down for 10 million. <laughs> sure. So, so when you say 30% utilization, so you have a available balance of ten thousand dollars. You have a ten thousand right. dollar credit card, and you keep that usage under three thousand. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. All right. And again, I that's think that in their eyes, you are managing that. You can manage that based on what your salary says to approve you for the first time. Anyway, Understood. they base it on that. And so, if someone is using sixty or seventy percent of their credit limits availability, is that then going to be dinging their credit? Yes. They look at you as a risk, and that's when you can risk getting it lowered and they can do it at their discretion. Wow. And they don't even tell you. Sometimes you'll look at the credit score and they say one thing tomorrow to be something else and it'll drop 20 points and you're going, what is this? And you look at the card and say, oh, I'm now down to 5,000. Mm. So now instead of being 30% usage, I'm now yeah. at over 50% wow. of 5,000. Okay. Yeah, so I can yeah. I can see. So I think what you're saying is it re you really have to manage then your credit report Yes. Knowing what's on there, knowing if any of your balances have changed. I mean, I think that, that is, that's important. I don't think people look at their credit report no. as often as they should be. Um, so you mentioned, so credit card is, carries a, a super high weighting in terms of importance. Right. So then what other types of debt are being reported on someone's credit report? The least one is medical. Even though the balances are high for medical bills, because no, a lot of us don't have insurance, a lot of people really are working around this world without insurance. So they're paying t out of pocket for everything. So they're getting these $2,000 bills for the emergency room. 10% mm. mm. of that. If you go five times in a year, do you have it just to come out and pay? So they, they'll, those, are, those are reported, but when somebody's trying to loan you something, they don't count it as much as a credit card. Okay. It holds less weight. What about um, car payments? Those are reportable. Absolutely. Um, my personal choice would be to try to find shop around for the best interest rate. Okay. 
because by the time you're done paying for that car at the highest rate that they possibly can offer you, based on your credit, you could pay up to 19%. Wow. On a $30,000 car. Okay. You pay for that car almost twice. Wow. By the time your, your loan is done. Absolutely. So your, your, and your credit being good can get you a 3%. Okay. So I Such think, a difference. yeah, I mean, so that's fascinating. Then I assume things like uh, a mortgage, so we yes. haven't addressed that. So in terms of what credit companies are looking at, more you're paying your mortgage on time and your mortgage, um, kind of what your track record has been, where does that fall in terms of? Now that gets tricky. Okay. Mortgages, everybody else is 30% and lower. Mortgages are 10% and lower. In addition to a deposit or down payment. So, when you're going to buy the house, try to get everything under that 10% mark. And that's mm -hmm. utilization, not what you owe, utilization. Because you can have a $50,000 car and, pay and you have a 10% balance. You're perfect. Because you have the ability to spend it, but you didn't spend it. So you're looking like a good risk to the bank that's loaning you the mortgage. Okay, okay. Yeah. So that... Um you know, especially if, if you're looking for, you know, first time home buyers and obviously we're in a we're in a challenging environment to begin with, I would think that things like credit score is gonna be a huge component of getting the interest rate that we're looking for. So um, I know we just have a few minutes here left in our first um, video of the series and so um, I guess are there any other pertinent um, types of credit that that Americans should be kind of being aware that this is affecting, um, you know, their credit score or things that maybe are having a higher weight than maybe we're thinking about or right now weight? it's credit cards. Credit cards. Okay. We have to use them to live, but we have to learn to use them smarter. Yeah. Because right now we're using them for everything, but we're not giving them the attention they need to mm. keep them functioning. Because most of them, they can save you, but they can sure. also cause you. To to the, your demise if you don't watch it. Yeah, because I've seen many time and time again how easy it is for them to snowball. And so yeah. I know you and I were talking before we started taping and you were talking about some tips that you share with your clients when they come to you. And so why don't we real quick just talk about um, any tips that you know of with people trying to pay down credit cards or not accumulating more interest than they need to be. What are, what are some of the things you've been telling your clients? The biggest thing is to know your statement date versus your due date, and they're two different things. The statement date is the, t the date before they start adding interest and fees, because most credit cards have fees as well. And if your, your fees are $25 and you're paying $25, what happens? Balance doesn't really it doesn't move. Right. Okay. So you have to figure out the sweet spot. You have to put enough on that card, which is the twenty-five dollars in fees. Hit it before the interest incurs, so every payment you make actually makes your payment balance going move. towards principal. Going towards then. your principal. So, and I think this is fascinating that you know because this is something that I didn't even realize it, the fact that you can have your statement date be from June one to August one date might not be in your payment due until August 15th. Well, if you pay it on the 14th, you think you're paying it early, but you've already allowed the interest then to hit the account and, and the accrue fees. and the fees. So mm -hmm. that is if when you're trying to pay down credit cards or not accrue interest, we want to be making sure those payments are being made before the statement date, not necessarily the due date. And so I think, I mean, that is, that's such great information. And sometimes it's not on your statement. You may have to call your bank personally that you have the loan with, the credit card with, and say, when is my statement date? It's public knowledge, they have to tell you. They don't like it because that's how they make their money. Sure. But right. our job is to make sure you keep your money. <laughs> so call and find out what that date is. That's excellent. So, well, we thank you so much for joining in again to this kind of introductory video on credit and credit management. We're actually, this is going to be um, a multi-step series where we're going to be getting into more and more things about what to do, how to manage your debt, and take steps to begin to um, repair and reduce your debt. So Shanti, I thank you so much for joining us for our video today. Again, Shanti is with Copeland Consulting. Um, and so I know she's always available for questions. And so we do have her contact information up here. S.M. Copeland at copelandconsulting.org if you want to reach out to her directly. 
Again, I'm Ashley Ross with Victory Fiduciary. I'm always happy as well to answer questions. Ashley R at victoryfiduciary.com. Thanks for joining in, and we will be seeing you again uh, soon with Shanti. Thanks Have a for good having day. me.